I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be here. I'm blessed to be a part of it. And tonight is February the 8th, 2012, and the name of my message is Trading Troubles for Treasures. And this is a message I hope that will bring encouragement and hope to you. Um, I really felt like the Lord spoke to me and um, encouraged me to share this message. I was going in a direction, and um, I had a plan, and he just messed it up. <laughs> you know, he's just like that. And even even up till today, I'm saying, Lord, you really want me to share this? And I really feel like it's if it's not for every one of you, one day you'll be able to draw on it. But um, we all go through things, and I just think that there's some people in this congregation that are going through some things, and this will bring hope and encouragement to you, and I hope it will bless you. So um, I want to start out uh, reading a psalm, uh, Psalm 34, verse 17 through 22. Yeah. <laughs> the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. And he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. How many does he deliver us from? All. All. <clears throat> um, Psalm 46 and 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of our God. Um, and in Psalm 77, this is a pretty long psalm. <clears throat> And um, the psalmist is, is evidently in great distress. And he said, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord at night, and I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night, and my heart mused, and my spirit inquired, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, To this I will appeal, the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. We have to remind ourselves of who God is in times of trouble. And, you know, 2 Corinthians 4.17, you don't have to turn there, but it says, For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Everything we walk through brings glory to God if we allow him to work through us and in us. So we're going to turn to Genesis 37. And this is a familiar story to a lot of you, and that's what I told the Lord. Y'all already knew all about Joseph. But, um, and we're going to cover a lot of scripture. So we're going to camp here for a while in, in Genesis. Have you ever been tested to the point of breaking? Yes, Emmanuel. Have you ever been rejected by your own family and friends because yes, you were yes. a Christian? Has anyone ever been jealous of you to the point of torment? Have you ever been torn because you feel as if you've been faithful to the Lord and you don't understand why He's allowing you to walk through the things that you're walking through? I've been there. I've been in all those places. I've been to, to the place where I felt like this was the last straw, Lord. I can't take another thing. This, you know, I can't take another thing. I don't think I'm going to make it. But yet, I knew my hope was in the Lord and that, that He was the only one that I could turn to. Um, I've been rejected by my natural family. Um, becoming a Christian out of a family that was um, denominational uh, brought a lot of persecution. And 
not the kind of persecution that Joseph went through, but persecution that was tormenting, always being made up fun of and kicked on and ridiculed because of my beliefs. And there were times when I felt like, I just can't go back there. I just, I just can't go back there. But God would always convict me. He said, you're the light. How are they going to see the light if you give up? And so I continued to push myself into these situations. But I've also been in a place where I felt like we, we were walking uprightly before the Lord and just doing the will of God. And then these catastrophes happen in our life. And I'm like, I don't understand. I just don't understand why he allowed me to walk here. I don't understand why I'm going through this. But God promises us that nothing that we go through is without a purpose and a plan for, for his glory. And so looking to the word and finding it in the word, why God allows us to walk in the places that we don't think we can walk, you know, that it's too deep for us. Uh, I haven't been saved long enough. I, you know... And the, the pace has escalated, and I think that a lot of you are going through a lot of intense times because God is perfecting you. That's what these things do. They bring us to another place in God. Amen. And we learn to trust in places that we never trusted before. And then we get faith to trust in the next place when we walk through something bigger or when somebody else is walking through something. So I just want to go to Joseph and talk about Joseph a little bit. You know, um, Joseph was a young man. The first verse is talking about Jacob, and the second, this is the count of uh, Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Billa and the sons of Zelpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Well, Joseph was a tattletale, you know, and um, nobody really likes a tattletale. But Joseph was 17 and he was immature. Now, Israel, his dad, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made him a rich and ornamented robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. Has the father's love been on you, and somebody hated you just because the father's love was on you? Because they were jealous? <clears throat> well, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to the dream I had. And as you read the rest of the scripture, you, you know, you see that um, he's talking about he was going to be over his brothers. And of course, they hated him all the more. And then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. You know, sometimes God doesn't want us to tell everything that he tells us. Sometimes he shows us things far in advance of when they're going to happen. And we, we think that it's going to happen next week because the Lord spoke it. And... Um, so we get, you know, excited and we start sharing it with unbelievers or family or whatever. And then they start to make fun of us. Or um, I, I had someone that was told me the story about a woman that was praying to um, be able to stop working so she could stay at home with her children. And um, another person was just, just said, well, how is that working for you? Mocking her and making fun of her because she wanted to stay home with her children. And it was just because she's a Christian, she wanted to raise him, you know, in the fear of God. And so, um, his brothers were jealous, and they just decided to do something about it. Um, they despise you when you're a little bit arrogant, you know, like, I know it all kind of thing. And that's what happened to Joseph. They despised him. And they were provoked to je jealousy because he had favor on him from the father. And the other thing they do is they discourage you in your dreams and what God has for you. But people will always talk against what you're planning. You know that the Lord is planning for you. And they just don't understand the favor of God. You know, you can't expect the world to understand God's favor. And so his brothers, uh, if you'll go down to verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in his mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their flo father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. And then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? 
He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man said. Um, I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him at a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of those cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. And when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. You know, he tries to take a stand. Reuben, his brother, does try to take a stand. But he evidently didn't feel like he could stand up against the rest of them. So have you ever seen people go along with the crowd instead of doing the right thing? Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we just, we're mute. We just don't say anything because we just go along with the crowd. But Reuben tried to rescue him. And so uh, in verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. That was one source of their jealousy. It represented the father's favor. And they really didn't like that, that he was a chosen one. You know, sometimes you just, people just can't understand when you're chosen by God to do a particular task. They're jealous of the fact that they want to do what you're doing. And so they have to, uh, have to come to terms with that. And um, so in 26, Judah said, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? So Judah, Judah had a little guilt working on him too. He said, let's not lay our hands on, our, on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. And so, you know, the rest of the story, that Joseph was sold into slavery because of his brothers. Jealousy is a serious issue, and it's a vicious attack that will come with it. And, you know, if you're not wise to the devil's schemes, you might may cower to that thing. But, you know, God told us to love even our enemies, and even them that despitefully use us. So um, we have to raise the bar and the standard. <clears throat> you know, um, James 1 and 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test of time, he will receive a crown of life. That's the treasure that we're looking for. We're looking for the crown of life. We want to reap the blessings of eternity. <clears throat> So these troubles that we endure on this earth are not worth comparing with the treasures that we'll have in heaven. Do you think if Joseph knew how long it would take to see everything accomplished, that he would have said yes? Would you? It's a long time. Um, in um, 23 and through 36, it talks about them dipping Joseph's coat in the blood and returning to the father and telling the father, you know, that he had been killed. You know, when people want to hurt you, they don't care if they break the father's heart. You know, I, I, I did, in my, my notes, I put sinners don't care if they break the heart of God. But, you know, sometimes Christians don't care. Right. They don't even put into perspective that this other person is God's child, you know. And so they don't really care if they break the, the heart of the father God. Um, so we're going to skip over chapter 38 that's um, back at the ranch <laughs> and uh, go to uh, chapter 39 and um, in verses 1 and 2 now it says now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt Potiphar, an Egyptian <coughs> one of Pharaoh's officials the captain of the guard bought him and the Ishmaelites who, who, from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there the Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. You know, sometimes when you're sold out, the Lord just blesses you anyway. And his favor reigns on you in the midst of your trouble. If you shine forth his light, you know, when you're being persecuted or being tried um, financially or any other way, and you leave, you, you leave a testimony for God, his favor will remain on you. <clears throat> and so 
Um, in verse 8, uh, he was tempted. And he refused the temptation. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. <laughs> How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph stood up for righteousness sake at the risk of a great loss. Now he might not have known that he was standing in faith and that it would bring him to prison, but he was willing to do whatever it took to remain righteous in the eyes of the Lord. And um, he wanted to honor the man that had you know, brought him into this place. But in 3920, we, um, we see that when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. You know, sometimes your prison is not about you. Sometimes the place you are, the tough place you are, is for somebody else. Right. And, you know, we say we love each other, but do we really love each other? Would we willingly, really lay down our life? or, you know, suffer, endure something for somebody else. I just want to encourage you today that you are enduring for the kingdom's sake. You are enduring for souls that are lost. And so if you keep pressing on in the middle of your prison, God is going to bless you. He's going to raise you up. So um, while Joseph was in prison, um, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So he put everything under his command while he's in prison. So he's in charge. And he has all this favor. But I believe he was there for this cupbearer. It was a series of events, just like Jen's vision says, you set into motion something when you're obedient or when you're placed in a certain place and you do what God wants you to do. And so he was there for the cupbearer. And um, the cupbearer and the baker both had dreams, and they didn't know what they meant. And Joseph told them what the dreams meant, and so this was a, had a twofold purpose. It set the cupbearer free, but um, it also gave him an opportunity to uh, find favor. But sometimes you do good things for people, and they forget all about you. And um, he said, well, you know, I did such a show for somebody, you know, I mean, they could have at least repaid the favor and <clears throat> put in a good word for me or whatever. We have expectations of people sometimes that we think they should do something and they don't. But you know what that was all about? God's perfect timing. It was God's appointed time. He had to wait two more years after he shared the dreams. He had to wait two more years before the cupbearer remembered him. And so, sometimes when you're doing good, you don't see any fruit right away, just wait. God will bring it to pass. Um, and you can use your gift while you're in your trouble. Joseph used his gift, his ability that God gave him to interpret dreams. He used it while he was in the prison. He was faithful with what God had given him. Because you know, sometimes we just gripe and complain because we don't get to do it the way we want to do it, when we want to do it. But God has an appointed time, and he will allow us a season where he's trying and perfecting us to the place he can use us. So, two full years passed in, in um, chapter 41. When two full years had passed, then Pharaoh had a dream. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembered who Joseph was. It was beneficial to the cupbearer to know who Joseph was because it brought him favor with the Pharaoh also because he was able to give an answer to a problem. You're in prison or you're in your trouble for a reason. And if you'll just wait long enough, you'll see the fruition of what God's doing. You don't always understand it and you don't always know, but you just have to trust that God is God in the midst of it. So... Um, don't be disappointed when other people don't return your favors or do what you think they need 
you need them to do. Um, just trust that God has ways and means past finding out, and he'll put you in a position that he wants you in as soon as you're ready for the position. Because your gift will make a way for you. Amen. If you submit yourself to the Lord and you wait on God, your gift will make a way for you. Um, in verse 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. How old was Joseph when he started telling his dreams? So he's 30 years old. And he's still a work in progress. God's still working on him. He still has him in the scars of affliction. But um, Joseph is faithful. And in verse 51, Joseph praises God because he's given him a son. And he named him Manasseh, which means because God has made him forget all my troubles. You can forget about your troubles if you put your eyes on Jesus. And then his second son it was, is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. God will make you fruitful where you are, while you're suffering, while you're going through stuff, as long as you're faithful. <clears throat> Seven more years, verse 53. So um, we're talking 20 years had passed before he was able to see something happening in his family. Um, the seven more years of abundance, which was good, you know, for, for Joseph, he was able to fulfill the things that God had told him to do to help the country. And then his family um, began to cry out because they were in a famine ravaged land. And they had to turn to Egypt. But all that was God's doing to bring this family back together. And this is my encouragement to you tonight. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your friends. Keep pressing in there. 20 years, he waited to see something happen. And he never even knew if it would. I served God 20 years before I saw my mom saved. And... Um, I just can't tell you. I never thought she would. I had almost given up hope that she would get saved. She was 62 years old when she got saved. And um, so um, I want to encourage you. Keep sowing seeds. Keep being faithful. Keep planning. Doing good to others. And God is going to bring something about that's going to amaze you. Um. You know, Joseph learned some things with his brothers. Um, he realized that whenever they came to him, if you'll turn to um, eight, verse 18 in chapter 42. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. And so they said, they proceeded to say, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. You think they had a little guilt? Mm -hmm. You think 20 years they were not fed with the fact that they had sold their brother? And that, that guilt worked on them for 20 years. They were uh, in that crucible, you know, never able to forget. And so when this thing came up with, this, uh, with Joseph, um, them going to Joseph for food, they were taking on the responsibility, hey, you know, this is because of what we did wrong. And um, Reuben replied in verse 22, didn't I tell you not to sin against that boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They didn't realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and he began to weep. Joseph was broken for what breaks the heart of God. Even though his brothers had sold him out, 
and delivered him over to slavery, he didn't allow bitterness to creep in. You know, that's something that we really have to guard against. Because that's our tendency. You know, we, we tend to, to want to just get bitter in the midst of that furnace of, of affliction that God puts us in. Uh, we tend to want to blame other people. Um, but Joseph refused to do that. He saw them the way God sees broken people. He saw them with eyes of compassion and mercy. And that's the way we should look upon those that, that hurt us. So, but he didn't really just rush to their rescue. He sort of played a little game with them. And, you know, so that's, a, that's a tip of wisdom. Sometimes after you've been burned, you learn something. You don't just rush to somebody's rescue. Sometimes you have to wait until they're ready to receive what you have to offer. I've had that occasion many times. I used to be the do-gooder in the family. You know, I was always there for everybody's aid, and they always called me the peacemaker and all this kind of stuff. And I was always the one that was keeping the peace in the family and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but after being burned a bunch of times, <laughs> being used, <clears throat> I began to get a little wiser and realize I needed to wait so they were ready. So they really were looking for answers for God. And so that'll happen in, in the midst of your circumstance with people that have offended you or hurt you in any way. If you'll wait, they'll be coming to you for the answers because they'll begin to see the fruit that's in your life. They'll see that you're prospering in the middle of your trouble, that you're still smiling, that you're still having joy in your heart, you know, and they'll come to you. When troubles come to them, they'll realize that you have something that they don't. So that's one of the purposes for you, the Lord allowing you to go through some of these things so that the others that are watching you can see God at work on this earth. <clears throat> so it seemed utterly detrimental to him to be sold into slavery, to be put into prison. But God was really doing something much greater and bigger than even Joseph could imagine. He was actually saving Israel. Um, in verse 45 and 5, after Joseph played a lot of games with his brothers, <clears throat> he said, Do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been a famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great de deliverance. Your trouble can be bringing your brothers, your sisters, your friends into the place where God's ready, and they're ready for God to allow God to work on them. And he's going to use you if you let him. You know, if you don't resist what God's doing in you right now, whatever you're walking through, if you allow God to perfect you in that place, then you're going to be the testimony that they look to. They're going to be, they're, they're going to be coming to you. And it's happened. It's happened to me a number of times that, um, you know, when I thought, that's over. I can't, you know, I can't deal with them anymore. You know, um, they'll come back to me. And they'll ask for my advice, and they'll seek my wisdom, you know, and, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, my mind's rolling, and I'm thinking, well, you didn't want it before. But you see, they weren't ready. They weren't ready then. God had to do a lot of things. He had to put them in a hard place, just like uh, Jacob and his family was in a hard place. His brothers were in a hard place. <coughs> Jacob um, had to endure all this time without his son and thought he was dead. And could you imagine what it would be like to find out that he was really alive? Um, so, you know, our treasures, the things that we treasure, have to be spiritual. And our troubles are momentary. You know, in um, uh, Psalm 138 and 7, it says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. 
You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes with your right hand you gave me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. So, in the appointed time, might be 20 years, you might have to plow some ground. The Lord might have to tear you down and pick you up and tear you down before you're ready to do what God's calling you to do. And to resist what he's doing is doing a great injustice to yourself. Because the more you're resisting, the longer the work takes. And we can heed the progress by following him, by doing, you know, even in the hard places when we have to do things we don't want to do. If we'll just continue to be faithful in that, we can, we can cause that progress to be faster. Um, in Matthew 6, 19, familiar scripture you all know, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rot destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. If your treasure is eternal, if your treasure is the things of God, all this stuff, you know, houses, land, cars, whatever, that's all passing. It's so temporal. And in the blink of an eye, Charlie Dot, y'all still see his dot? No, he didn't really put it up there. I told him, I said, I can't believe you put that dot on the wall. And he said, uh, I didn't put that dot on the wall. <laughs> and he said, I wouldn't uh, mark the paint. I said, well, everybody else thought you did. I said, I need to tell them. But anyway, um, <laughs> that little blip in eternity, that's our lifespan. And so what we're walking through now, it's just a short period of time. And the sad thing is, you know, this is kind of the sad part. When you get over this one, there's another one. You know, there's other trouble that we're going to go through, but it's for our perfection, it's for our growth, it's for our strengthening. And even though it doesn't feel good, but neither does a whipping feel good. <laughs> um, God's doing something. And, you know, God's brought you here to this place. It's a good place. It's the land of abundance, the spiritual abundance. He's brought you here. And he's got a purpose for you. He's got a plan for you, your life. And, you know, sometimes, when, especially when you're young, you think, oh, man, if it doesn't hurry up and happen, it'll never happen. But that's not true. <coughs> that's not true. He's got things so much greater than you could imagine waiting in line for you. And you, sometimes it just surprises you. You don't even know what's going to happen. When we went to Chicago, we thought we were getting away from family drama, and we were just happy to leave the drama. <laughs> so, like, I'll go anywhere, wherever we got to go. And um, so um, we got there, and, you know, we, were, we weren't there only a year. And when we got ready to leave, there's this crowd of people that want to send us off. And we impacted so many lives. And, um, I mean, I, I get so many Facebook things that they're trying to get in touch with me, we miss you, all this kind of stuff. We impacted people's lives. I never even thought that would happen. That was just like an added bonus to getting away from the drum. But it just, I mean, what, the point I'm making is that he will surprise you in the midst of what you're walking through. He'll bring things into your life and you'll be able to bless other people. And I, I won't sell you, there's nothing. There's nothing that I've ever done that has been more exciting to me than to touch somebody's life for the Lord. And I can honestly say that with all my heart. It's like you get a shot in the arm and you feel rejuvenated. Even if it's a little thing, even if somebody just says, man, that word really just encouraged me today. You know, it's, it's the little things we need to look at. Instead of waiting for that big thing to happen. You know, instead of like, I gotta trudge through all this junk to get there. Yeah, we do. But uh, all that junk that we trudge through, look at Joseph, what he was able to do in his lifetime. He blessed a lot of people. He saved a lot of people's lives. And everything that he went through, he looked at it positively. Now, I can't honestly say that I'm always right, jolly on the spot. First thought is, oh, yeah, good, I get to suffer. 
You know, um, I can't say that. Sometimes the Lord has to work on me a little while. You know, and uh, and so, but the, the process is worth it. You know, if you keep the long haul in mind, if you keep what you're working towards in mind, and you don't give up, you're gonna reap. You know, you're gonna reap. God is faithful, and He's faithful to you, and He's called each and every one of you. He has a plan for your life, and He wants to fulfill it. Let's help to accelerate that process by being compliant during the times that are trying, trying to let God do His work. And I don't really want to say all that because I know I'm going to have to walk it. You know, when you say it, you got to walk it. But uh, I just want to encourage you all just to uh, keep pressing in there. And um, the ones of you that I know that the Lord said that you were walking through something and that it was tough. And that sometimes you wonder how you're going to get to the next step. God said his hand is right there. Just reach out your hand and take one baby step at a time. He'll follow you. Amen. Amen. Amen.